morning, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, this webinar. Um, my name is Babis Ismanidis. I am a team lead uh, responsible for strengthening surveillance, epidemiological studies, and data use for action at the Global TB program, and I will be chairing the webinar today. Um, to start off, I would like to invite um, the director for the Global TB program, Dr. Teresa Casaiva, to um, give us her opening remarks. Teresa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Babis. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, it's a pleasure um, for me to join you today and to welcome you to this NTB uh, webinar on strengthening TB surveillance, supporting countries to transition to case-based uh, digital surveillance systems. As we all know, TB remains one of the world's top infectious disease killers, despite of being a preventable and curable disease. Continuing COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant disruptions to TB services, resulting in many people that fell ill with TB missing out on access to care and a TB mortality uh, on the rise for the first time in more than over the decade. This affects particularly the most uh, poor and vulnerable populations. And we can see also that ongoing conflicts in many uh, regions uh, um, also um, multiplicated uh, these hardships. Since the adoption of WHO NTV strategy and the sustainable development goals by all member states in 2014 and 2015, high level commitments have galvanized global, regional and national progress. And we've managed to put spotlight on TB at the first ever UN high level meeting at ANGA in 2018 again reaffirmed our commitment and set very ambitious but reasonable targets. But we have to say that uh, we are not on track uh, to reach these targets. That's why uh, to measure progress towards national and global targets uh, for TB, countries need strong surveillance system that allow them to reliably monitor the TB epidemics and progress. A strong surveillance systems that produce reliable and high quality data are essential to understand the magnitude of TB burden and what impact our programmatic interventions are having. Strengthening TB surveillance system is one of the strategic areas of work at the Global TB program. Uh, for nearly a decade together with the national TB programs around the world, as well as together with our partners, uh, donors, uh, and donors WHO has been leading these uh, um, global efforts. Dedicated investments for strengthening surveillance systems are much needed, especially in countries with a weaker system, and such uh, as those still relying on paper forms. We need to support all countries with their transition as fast as possible to more robust uh, digital case-based real-time surveillance systems for TB. And we see now um, uh, the learning uh, from the experience uh, of, from COVID-19 pandemic and response uh, that it is possible uh, when we have necessary prioritization, understanding of the importance of these efforts, and then uh, very fast we can, we can see progress and even real-time reporting. Uh, this uh, webinar uh, uh, comprises presentations from uh, the Global TB program of the WHO Global Fund, University of Oslo, uh, and, uh, and our partners as well as WHO will try to address different, of, uh, different aspects um, uh, of the strengthening uh, national TB surveillance systems. We will also present, <clears throat> present some lessons learned from the implementation of DHIS two case-based surveillance systems for TB in five countries. Uh, we welcome a presentation from the National TB Program of Tanzania on their experience with implementing uh, such a system. We uh, hope that it will be um, useful for you to see some concrete examples from the country. Uh, 
we will have also questions and answers uh, session by the end of the seminar and hope that you will be actively uh, involved and will post your questions. Um, so with the, this, I will stop and hand over to my colleagues and wish to all of us a very successful and productive meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, a couple of um, uh, house rules. Um, the first thing to mention is that the recordings for this webinar uh, in all available languages will be circulated uh, in a news flash um, in the coming days. So do not worry about, um, um, about ha having the information and the presentations later on. We will be sharing those. Um, the, we have uh, simultaneous translation for uh, English and uh, sorry, for English, English is the main language the webinar will be presented in. We have interpretation for uh, French and Spanish. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that functionality in Zoom, it's um, there should be a button, a button at the bottom of uh, your screen uh, with a little globe called interpretation. You can click on that uh, and switch between languages. And then lastly, um, we do have, um, we do invite uh, you to uh, post your questions and comments uh, using the chat function. Uh, as Teresa has mentioned, uh, we have planned for a, a Q&A session at the end of the seminar, um, but it is a very rich agenda. Um, so in case uh, we don't have as much time as we would like to at the very end, what we will be doing is responding to your questions and comments throughout the webinar. So please feel free uh, to use the chat function and, um, and communicate with us, stay in touch with us. All right, so um, having covered that, let's um, uh, open an, uh, the, the webinar and start with uh, the first presentation by my colleague Marek Lali, who will be giving you uh, an overview of the guidance and products um, that are available or about to be uh, released by the Global TB program uh, to support countries in their efforts to transition to case-based digital surveillance for TB. Marek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Babis. Good afternoon, everybody, and a good morning to our um, colleagues in the region of, of uh, the Americas. Um, as Babis mentioned, I'm going to open this webinar with, um, with a presentation um, outlining the guidance and products that are currently available and those that are um, in production and, and coming out soon to support TB case-based digital surveillance. So as most of you will probably know by now, the WHO Global Task Force on TB Impact Measurement was established in 2006. Um, this is um, a network of national TB programs from many countries, as well as uh, key international um, technical partners, as well as funding agencies. There are five main strategic areas of work for the Global Task Force. Um, the work stream that we're going to be discussing today in, um, in this webinar fit under strategic areas number one and five. So that's to strengthen national notification systems for the direct measurement of TB cases and the analysis and use of TB data at the country level. One activity that um, we coordinate and implement at the Global TB program are epidemiological reviews and assessments of national surveillance and vital registration systems for TB. And these activities are a dynamic process for informing policy, planning, and programmatic action by identifying and addressing gaps in surveillance, ME, and data use. There are two main components to these activities. Um, one is an assessment of the TB surveillance system, um, looking at the dimensions of data quality, system coverage, both overall and for key uh, subpopulations. And then the second is a detailed analysis of TB data and other relevant data um, that's available for the national and subnational level, as well as different risk groups. And findings from these assessments are then turned into recommendations for the country to help them um, strengthen their surveillance system. 
And these are also used to um, guide the organization and implementation of, of program reviews, the development of MNE plans, of the development of national strategic plans, as well as investment cases, uh, investment plans for strengthening surveillance, MNE, and data use. And these findings and recommendations are also used for guiding domestic and international resource allocation. In 2020, we carried out a, a global synthesis of all of the findings and recommendations from, the, from all of the assessments that were carried out between 2013 and April 2020. So at the time, there were 81 countries who had carried out um, this assessment. And these findings and recommendations are used to guide global, regional, national priorities and the direction that we need to be taken taking um, in order to strengthen TB surveillance and the analysis and use of TB data. And from this, um, from this synthesis, the number one prioritized recommendation was to transition to or strengthen digital case-based real-time surveillance. And this was the number one recommendation at the global level, as well as across all of the WHO regions. Um, the, the Stop TB partnership recently completed um, a an assessment of digital TB surveillance systems in 19 um, strategic initiative countries. And the cross-cutting messages and um, country-specific information are available at the link um, on their website at the link on the yellow bar at the bottom of the slide. So the ultimate vision that we're trying to get to is a unified digital case-based real-time environment for TB surveillance. So people with TB don't just access um, TB services at the health facility. They are also accessing services at the laboratory and they're also receiving um, services at their house, so in the household, within the community and even at the workplace. And all of these different sectors are generating data um, along the whole pathway of TB prevention and care. So we have data at the, at the population level, so who's at risk of TB infection and disease. We have data on TB screening, TB diagnosis, treatment, as well as management of comorbidities, post-TB care, and the final um, patient outcome. So what we're aiming to do is to capture, analyze, and use data along the whole pathway of TB prevention and care and across these different sectors so we can have a consolidated surveillance database that um, while avoiding fragmentation of information systems and project-based solutions and promote the integration with overall health information system plans. So now let's look at the products um, that are currently available that support this initiative. We have the WHO surveillance standards for TB data collection and the calculation of indicators. And these are described in detail in the definitions and reporting framework for tuberculosis, which was, lat, which was last revised in 2013. We have standards for data visualization in the form of standardized dashboards, which are included in our um, DHIS2 packages, which we'll talk more about throughout the webinar. And we have recommendations for routine analyses that should be carried out and how to use these data for programmatic action. And these are discussed in the Understanding and Using TB Data Handbook. We've been working with the University of Oslo to develop um, DHIS2 uh, packages for TB surveillance. We have one package for aggregate health facility data, and then we have another package for case-based uh, surveillance. For the aggregate package, we have a version that's hosted on, the, on a WHO server called tbhistoric.org. Um, we offer this um, tbhistoric.org to countries who do not yet have a digital system in place. They're still relying on a paper-based recording and reporting system um, to safeguard their data in, in this platform rather than keeping these data on thousands of Excel sheets um, on a laptop. And we also um, offer this uh, platform to be used in the context of epidemiological reviews uh, to support the analytical component of these activities. Um, the countries welcome to keep their account open, to continue to access their data, of course, um, and to maintain it uh, going forward. 
However, this isn't a sustainable solution. It's just something that's meant to be used in the interim. Um, so the metadata package for this aggregate DHIS2 package for TB surveillance can be downloaded from the DHIS2 website and um, installed on a local server so that the country can own the system and maintain it locally. The case-based version of this package is also available for, the metadata for this is also available for download on the DHIS2 website. Um, now, the difference between these two packages is the type of data that are being entered, how the data are entered, and the type of data that are being stored. So for the aggregate package, um, we're manually aggregating the data from the, pa from the paper registers, just like in a paper-based system. We're, we're capturing these aggregate data on a quarterly report form, which we're, which we're all very familiar with, and then entering these data on a digital quarterly report form that's within the DHIS2 package. And for the case-based surveillance package, you're actually entering the, the data um, at the individual um, patient level. Um, and what you're essentially establishing is a digital TB register. So there's no need for manual aggregation from the paper registers at the health facility. So those are the two main differences between the two packages. Um, but after that, the, the standards remain the same. So when it comes to the indicators, the data visualization on the dashboards and the analyses, these are the same between the two packages. We developed a set of supporting material uh, for the package implementation and its use. We have an installation guide. We have a guidance document um, that describes the indicators. We have an exercise book uh, to guide you through the routine analyses, and we have a set of associated uh, training material. And we use this supporting material as well as the DHIS2 packages for our multi-country and national face-to-face -face workshops to strengthen local capacity on TB data analysis and use. And it's important to note that TB is not alone in this initiative. We're working with the Health Data Collaborative. So we're part of a multi-program uh, integrated approach to strengthening health facility data. Returning to our vision for a moment, now let's look at the products that are upcoming to help support reaching, reaching this vision. In terms of the upcoming products and tools, we're continuously working on the DHIS2 development in collaboration with the University of Oslo. We're expanding the packages so that we can now capture data and report data um, on household contact um, tracing, as well as data that are coming from the lab and including uh, presumptive TB cases that are sent for lab testing. We're working on a readiness assessment and implementation guide this is essentially a tool and associated technical assistance to support countries in assessing where they're at in terms of the prerequisites that need to be in place for, for digital surveillance, as well as identifying the actions that need to be taken in order to strengthen this foundation. We're working on a digital platform for TB planning and prioritization. This is uh, essentially a centralized digital repository um, for the consolidation and visualization of TB data and indicators from various global and national sources to increase the accessibility of these data and indicators to the TB programs and aim for a more comprehensive strategic planning process that's based on all available data. We're developing a national surveillance uh, profile mobile app that's going to be for both iOS and Android uh, devices. And this will be a mobile application to visualize the results from assessments of surveillance systems and associated recommendations. In terms of guidance and training, um, we're doing a major revision of the 2013 definitions and reporting framework, which we're now rebranding as a TB surveillance guidance. Um, this will now come with an expanded scope along the pathway of TB prevention and care, and it's going to put a bit more focus and discussion on um, digital surveillance systems. It's still going to be 100% relevant for uh, paper-based systems, but it's just going to have a bit more of a discussion on uh, digital surveillance systems and what needs to be included in these. We're updating the standards and benchmarks checklist. So this is the checklist that we use to assess TB surveillance systems. 
Um, we're updating some of the benchmarks so that they align better with the SDG indicators. And again, we're expanding its scope to include standards on treatment outcomes and TB, and, uh, TB prevention. The Digital Accelerator Kit will be a software agnostic toolkit for the configuration of digital systems to facilitate the calculation of standard indicators, uh, not just for TB surveillance in this case, but also for programmatic activities and clinical care. We're working on a record linkage guidance, which is a step-by-step -step set of instructions for undertaking a record linkage exercise using a publicly available tool. And the aim here is to promote routine record linkage exercises of, of um, case-based TB data. And finally, we're updating um, our training material. Um, and this will be translated into an e-course in collaboration with the WHO Academy, uh, which will help improve the outreach of our, of our training, as well as um, support the local training cascade uh, on data analysis and use. Um, so we have a lot of products coming up to, to support digital case-based uh, surveillance. If you have any questions on these, please feel free to, to reach out to either me or anyone else on the team, and we'll be uh, happy to, to talk about um, these products in, in more detail. Um, with that, I'll hand over back to Babes. Thank you. Thank you, Marek, for this uh, overview. Um, let's uh, let's carry on now with um, uh, one of our major partners in this uh, effort, uh, the Global Fund. So I would now like to invite uh, Michelle Monroe from the Global Fund to give us um, an overview of um, uh, the financial support, the possibilities for financial support for countries um, uh, in their effort to transition to case-based digital surveillance systems for TB. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, Merrick, can you stop sharing your screen? I need that to uh, be able to share mine. Okay. All right, Bamas, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Great. So hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Monroe, and uh, I'm with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And I'm on the ME team here and supporting uh, digital data systems. So today, I want to talk first about um, why Global Fund is uh, supporting this work and what aspects we're supporting. And then later in the webinar, I'll talk about some um, ways that uh, countries can uh, access um, uh, support uh, for implementation of these. So the reason Global Fund is supporting these tools that uh, WHO has been working on for digital case-based TV surveillance systems is uh, overall, you know, wanting to have impact on TB across the world and knowing that real-time digital case-based surveillance systems are a key accelerator to timely availability of uh, people-centric data in order to support uh, monitoring of the programs, um, improving outcomes of the programs, and also patient care. And Digital case-based surveillance for TB also is um, a, another a tool to really um, follow individuals um, as they move through the continuum of care for their TB and um, to be able to monitor and also improve that care. In addition, in the Global Fund strategy uh, that will be coming out new next year is uh, to a high priority to strengthen the generation and use of real-time digitized data and surveillance systems, including for TB. And we support this both as integrated systems and then also um, for the individual disease systems. And this strategy for the Global Fund is also highly prioritizing in general advanced levels of HMIS digitization, since we see this as a critical 
critical enabler um, for achieving uh, many of the global fund strategy goals, uh, particularly when it's uh, aligned, the level of digitization is aligned to the uh, disease context needs and to the uh, digital system uh, readiness in the country. So then how we support this is the main thing is the first bullet point, which is through the Global Fund country grants. And so by far, uh, the bulk of Global Fund support uh, for um, countries' data systems, including their digital data systems, is through the grants. And um, as you can see here, if we look at just um, for routine reporting systems in general, the investments in the grants in the current cycle are um, close to 250 million, and that's across 95 countries. Then um, on a much smaller scale, um, we do also have some central uh, funding um, outside of the grants uh, through what is called the Global Fund Data Strategic Initiative. There's multiple strategic initiatives at Global Fund, and one of them is specific to data. And within this one, we are prioritizing the support essentially for WHO and other partners to be um, developing global tools to be improving digital case-based surveillance systems. So including as Merrick just went through and as we'll be going through in more detail in the rest of the webinar, the WHO um, developed um, TB and HIV SMART guidelines. And then in particular for this webinar, we'll be going through the WHO RHIS toolkit and the DHS2 dig digital packages, including for TB case-based surveillance. So along with other partners, including PEPFAR and, and others, we support um, that central development. Also Stop TB recent report on uh, 20 prioritized countries um, status of their uh, digital TB surveillance systems. Then in that same smaller amount of funding uh, for the data strategic initiative, we do have technical assistance to support countries um, when there is bottlenecks in the grants that uh, need to be addressed quickly, uh, including aspects of um, supporting the implementation or strengthening of countries' uh, digital uh, case-based surveillance for TB. And just to kind of show here again, you know, um, at this webinar, of course, we're um, talking in more detail on um, those aspects here on the left, the WHO RHIS data toolkit and the WHO digi uh, DHIS2 digital packages. Um, but um, as I mentioned, just in that last slide, um, there's um, global fund support for um, these other uh, related activities as well and um, development of central tools uh, for uh, digital case-based systems. Then just a last slide is uh, to talk a little bit about why uh, we're supporting uh, these tools and packages. And uh, again, overall, it's to that these um, digital, it's to strengthen these uh, digital data systems because we do see them as enablers uh, to contribute to improved health outcomes um, against TB. And then more specifically within these, uh, digital data systems, these packages and tools, as you'll see once we go through them in a little more detail in the rest of the webinar, um, one of the uh, benefits of these is the cost savings and other efficiencies. Uh, there's a lot of, um, for digital data systems, a lot of work that does need to be country specific and, and adapted to meet what the country context and country specific forms and other aspects. But that um, at the same time, there's uh, many aspects that are common across um, all digital data systems for case surveillance in general and for TB in particular. And that work doesn't really need to be repeated in each country or for each type of software. Um, so instead, uh, supporting these tools and packages allows um, for that kind of common uh, pieces to be developed centrally countries can then take those and adapt them as they need to for their country specific context. Another reason that Global Fund is supporting this is that um, it uh, enables easier and faster reporting um, of, for the countries of higher data quality. So 
the these digital uh, packages and tools uh, are, uh, as Merrick mentioned, and as you'll see, moving ahead, fully aligned with the WHO strategic information guidelines, and really what they are, are actually translations of those WHO paper strategic information guidelines into the digital components that uh, software developers need in order to be able to design the system. So it saves countries from having to do that interpretation from the paper uh, technical guidance to the software development components. And um, therefore you get much better um, uh, quality of the um, indicators and how the um, business and process flows within the software work and are aligned to the WHO guidance. And then on that last bullet point there in the middle, um, these packages come with standardized indicators that of course can then the countries can adapt as they need to, but with that starting place from these standardized indicators to the global indicators, this really allows um, countries to map to these and to much more easily be able to report, not just to global fund, but to other um, donors and other global reporting while still adapting to what they need. And then lastly, just that, um, in addition to translating that WHO strategic information guidance uh, into the uh, software development uh, components and language, it also takes into account um, the WHO TB programmatic guidance. And particularly when we're looking at case surveillance or patient level uh, data systems, where you really do have to also, the data system itself has to actually incorporate the flows of a patient care and how they move through the facility and how they interact with the software and with um, individuals in the facility. Um, that's where it gets much trickier and is really um, ideal to have that translated uh, from the paper programmatic guidance to the software components centrally. And then um, countries can just take that and then adapt from there without having to do that all from scratch. So it really improves the, the programmatic quality and care that um, these systems are aiding as well. So with that, I'll stop. And later on in the webinar, I'll be back to talk about ways that um, Global Fund um, can also potentially support countries wanting to implement uh, these uh, tools that uh, we're going through in this webinar today. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, let's um, let's uh, continue um, with uh, our next major partner in these efforts, the University of Oslo, uh, Vittoria Crispino from the University of Oslo, who is going to be providing us with uh, a demonstration uh, for, of um, some of the available uh, DHS2 to, uh, TB tools for surveillance. Vittoria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Babe. Let me share quickly my screen. Um, I hope everyone can see it well. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria, and uh, I'm part of the Global Health Content and Standard team, which is the team that is uh, responsible for publishing the, the famous packages that everyone is mentioning. Um, with me today, there is also my colleague, Yuri, who will take care uh, after a brief uh, introduction and some important considerations on implementation, um, it will take care of uh, of like a quick overview of the of the package themselves uh, and in particular, of course, of the case based surveillance tracker. So to get straight into business, um, please slide. Okay. So um, just a quick overview of the WHO metadata um, packages that have been uptaken. Um, the HIS 2, um, maybe some of you know, some others don't know, but uh, in general, it works in partnership with, uh, uh, with the WHO and it has been a collaborating center since 2017. Um, one of the key aspects of this collaboration has been, of course, the creation of uh, standardized metadata packages. Um, and one of the reasons was, of course, to strengthen the data use on national, international, but also on lower from national level. So be it district, be it, uh, um, be it a region, but down to facility level if necessary. Um, overall, the metadata packages bring together the global standards, as mentioned before, but also the DHIS2 um, design practices for integrated health information systems. We see here in the map, of course, that uh, more than 60 countries 
so far have taken uh, WHO um, based packages. So you see it's been uh, widespread and the use is being uh, scattered throughout uh, the globe. Um, the, as, a, as mentioned before, of course, these, all these packages come from normative um, guidance. So the global guidance that gets put out from, uh, from the WHO, we integrate them into, into packages that can be integrated into national HMIS. And these packages support what? Support data capture, um, data entry, um, visualization, analysis, and, um, and of course can go down also to community data. And what's important about this is the fact that all this information can be, um, can be used and, and analyzed all in one, in one site, that it's the, is the national HMIS, and which means what? That you can analyze your data cross program and you can also um, go down and trickle down your information down to the lowest administrative level that you want to supervise and monitor in, in order to have your an idea of how your, your country and your, and your program in general is structured. Uh, we began in 2017, as mentioned, and we started just by four uh, programmatic areas, which was HIV, TB, malaria, and, and immunization. Currently now, as you can see, we have developed quite a lot and we cover many more areas, but what's important is that all these modules um, are all based on, uh, um, on global guidelines and they all have uh, standard um, visualizations that are coming from these guidelines and they all come with uh, in, informative guidelines uh, for, uh, for implementers, but also for countries or people who want to uptake these, these packages. And, uh, and that describe what's in the package and how to best implement it. What's very important that I would like to cover before we dig into the details of the, w, of the TB packages in DHIS is the fact that these packages not only come from, um, from uh, the, the, the general guidelines, of course the content uh, thresholds and all the important information come from there. But when I talk about um, other sources, I talk more about design. And all this information have like a life cycle as well, um, because these uh, once we put out and we publish a, a package, we also tend to go back to the to the countries or organizations um, who uh, have implemented these packages, and we like to um, discover and understand better how these packages have been uptaken, what kind of changes have been made to the packages. Why? Because this way it gives us a better idea of how the use of data and of the packages gets, uh, gets uh, implemented in the, in the countries. And that kind of feeds back into the design and also back to, to also how the information uh, flow from the, the origin of this information, therefore the, the, the facilities of the community up to the national and more like general overview of the, of the, of the system surveillance. As mentioned before as well, we have three main types of packages. The um, analytic package, which is um, a separate package from the aggregate, but it comes from the aggregate originally. So the aggregate is what, as Marix was saying, uh, we have uh, the aggregate number taken directly from the registers and, uh, and uh, an input in the tallies that are uh, digitalized in the system. And uh, together with this aggregate package, you also get some uh, predefined dashboards with the most important information that are supposed, and the minimal information at least, that uh, countries should be able to, to follow up in order to, to monitor their, their programs. The analytics dashboards, we also call them dashboard packages, are just the dashboards, the, the standard dashboards that we publish, which means what the countries can uptake them and, and simply um, map and link the information that they are already uh, collecting from their either systems that are already in country or um, Excels that still need to be imported. But what's important is that at least they are following uh, a certain standard of information and visualization in order to have one repository, a data warehouse, as we call it, um, to have all this information in one place. And then, of course, the, the, the important one for today's session, the tracker, which is the case-based um, 
uh, information and uh, which uh, um, follows up people uh, through time and give like detailed information of all the steps that they have to go through the program. Before everyone gets super excited and, keep, and start saying that we want the tracker, the tracker straight away, it's not to uh, kind of like uh, um, discourage you, but mostly to uh, give you a better idea on how to plan maybe your, your implementation. Of course, um, the case-based surveillance is the end point that everyone would like to achieve. And, and that's why we're here. We would like to have a case-based surveillance that can inform our decisions and can have can give us all the information, all the data that is needed in order to get the, that, that overview of the programs. But being able to ask, access in the country the tracker, um, so like case by case and enter this data, it's, it's not as simple. It's something that requires time, requires energy, requires investment. And, uh, and, um, and of course, all these information are not prescriptive, but these are things that we have seen also with other implementations of Straka. Um, but uh, these are um, suggestions to be considered. Therefore, like uh, if you have enough devices, if you have stable internet, if your staff is trained to do a real da real time data entry, or if you're rather considering to do uh, a backlog of data uh, entry um, after X, X time, be it days, be it weeks, and or for example, if you have a server and you have like your server capacity in order to host also all this information is very different hosting case-based information rather than, for example, a quarterly aggregate data information. So um, if some of the answers to these questions that are in the slide are no, um, what we suggest sometimes is to take a, um, a little step back and maybe to plan a, a phased implementation that can actually uh, take you through a hybrid approach. And what I mean by a hybrid approach is maybe to implement uh, partially or at least uh, in, some, um, in some centers, not necessarily uh, throughout the country, but in some key centers, maybe some the tracker and in some others, maybe where you don't have uh, already the, 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 the capacity, be it for because of uh, hardware, be, be it because of HR, we don't have the capacity to follow up on, uh, on a case-based surveillance quite yet. So you can do um, a mixed implementation of tracker information, but also aggregate information. And all these, in and all these data then actually, they can later on be visualized in, a, in an aggregated way. So you can always feed into one single place, one single um, dashboard or multiple dashboards that visualize the whole program. Um, all the information coming from the different uh, from the different um, uh, packages, let's say either the aggregate or the individual data. So here I have very quickly two scenarios. One scenario from data collection to data use, and this is like a country, let's say, where the tracker works very well, and where you can take your tracking program and have the, the data uh, fed into the, sur the surveillance metric. Uh, on a daily basis, and, uh, and you can aggregate this information very easily. Might be the case that you also want to implement among the different informations. Also, let's say stock report, or you have some population data that are uh, rather on aggregate uh, in on aggregate basis. So what you can you do? You follow up your your patients on a, on an individual data, and then aggregate everything. So you can also triangulate this information later on. With, uh, with the rest of the information that you're entering on aggregate basis. The scenario number two is actually the one that we see very, very often. It's actually probably one of the most, uh, the most common scenarios nowadays. Why? Because as I said before, it, implementing tracker on a national scale um, takes a lot of planning and a lot of investment. And as I said, it can be uh, the beginning of a hybrid implementation. Um, in, in this scenario, for example, you can have, uh, a tracking register in a separate instance, and it could be on a partial scale, be it, for example, in, uh, in the capital or in some specific centers where you have all the capacity that I mentioned before. But in some other areas, you might want to implement the aggregate data. Why? Be it because you cannot, uh, you cannot enter data on a daily basis or simply because it's easier in this situation to aggregate the information that is relevant to you and then visualize it 
along with the aggregate information. This means what though? That, that doesn't mean that you have to be choose one or the other. You can have the two system in parallel. And what you can do is that once you are uh, up to date with the tracker information, you can aggregate this information. While in the meantime, you can still, you take advantage of some of the important features that the tracker brings along. So like for example, reminders and notifications um, to patients via SMS, be it because your patient has been confirmed as a TB case, or, or any, or because that patient has been denotified in, in case you are actually tracking down also uh, presumptive cases. Um, you can also uh, triangulate this information, be it because you also have in, in place another tracker of another program, be it an, an HIV program or other, other programs. Therefore, you might want to triangulate this information also from other, other cohort. Or for example, also from lab requests, like uh, the, the, the new release of the packet of the tracker that we are going to have pretty soon. So you can have this, uh, this parallel data entry and, and data use uh, um, of, uh, of the system. And this can be, can be done very easily because DHS2 is per se very flexible. So not only the, the data sets and the programs can be, can be um, customized very easily in order to mirror better the, the, the country needs and, uh, and, uh, and the country context, but it can also be customized in order to have this double um, uh, parallel data entry that gets fed into one single place at the end of the reporting period. So the approach to do that very quickly is just to like uh, um, map the most important program indicators so that you can have like one single output and periodically generate this aggregation in order to have um, these, uh, these global dashboards and outputs that you might want to report. So now very quickly to go into the, the surveillance tools. So Yuri will have enough time to to give us a, a view of the of the system directly from uh, from our our demo environment, um, we have, as I said, the aggregate packages that you see here. We have uh, um, quite a few uh, data sets the, from case notification to treatment outcomes for first and second line treatments. But we also had uh, some uh, some um, old records um, data sets where you can actually start entering your old information in case you want to start catching up on digitalizing your, your older data that is not necessarily um, your real-time data entry, but it's, uh, it's still for comparative purposes. It's very important to have it and in case you would like to have, have them all in the same system. Coming soon, as, as Marek said, mentioned as well, uh, we will have a laboratory data set and also uh, the very important um, TB and COVID-19 impact assessment to measure the impact that COVID had on the national TB programs. The dashboard packages here are just like some screenshots of the package of the dashboards that the, the predefined dashboards that we have. As I mentioned, not you don't necessarily have to pick up the data sets, but you can also link the key information that you are collecting and uh, and, um, and make sure that you can visualize this information in a standard way because you're using the, 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 the standard dashboards. And finally, probably the most important one, the reason why we are here, the TBK surveillance tracker that is based on the WHO uh, reporting framework from, based from 2013, but probably the, not probably, there will be a, a, an updated version as soon as the new guidelines come out. And it provides a set of recommended metadata, be it uh, data elements, indicators, program rules, uh, and uh, and uh, all the uh, the rest of the all the remaining metadata metadata that is needed in order to build out the program, and this enables the electronic capture of the individual uh, TB cases. Um, it's uh, um, it's not intended to support necessarily patient management or patient care, um, but it is expected uh, to improve meta um, to improve that data quality because uh, uh, one would expect that the data entry uh, steps are reduced and the automatic calculation and warnings uh, are actually helping out uh, spotting the, the mistakes and therefore can, people can go back and fix those mistakes in order to have better data at the end of the reporting period. You can also uh, um, check whether you have duplicate, duplicate uh, cases in the system 
system because the system might uh, might be able to pop up uh, uh, and uh, flag that there are two cases that sound pretty much the same. So there are a lot of ways that you can actually improve the quality of your data. Uh, here you see, for example, um, uh, a, a workflow that is very general and, uh, and it has been worked on on the basis that both the, the, the clinical side, therefore the clinicians, being nurses, being whoever is actually following up the patients, uh, are able to enter data along with the laboratory side. So both, um, both sides can enter data and, and feed into the, the, the personal information of the, of the patients throughout the course of, the, of the, its treatment. What's very important, and I would like to stress as well, it's the fact that it's a question that we get asked very often, rightfully so, um, is that um, DHIS2 uh, is taking very seriously, of course, privacy and security of these data, um, especially from a technical point of view. You can, but there are like, we have put in place many, uh, many ways to, to protect this information, be it uh, from, uh, from anonymizing or pseudo anonymizing this information to actually like what is possible, for example, it's also to, uh, set access control from uh, to, to different users, or so that um, users that do not have access to particular organization units um, will be flagged and will be requested, for example, reasons why they are trying to access some specific patients. So there are multiple ways that you can control and uh, and um, and the privacy of your of your patients, especially in areas where like the. The, the 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 data might be sensitive for other for and uh, and people do, wouldn't like to not to disclose their their personal information. So here you have a general workflow, and it goes from the enrollment through the registration and the laboratory results, and you have a diagnosis. Whether you enter your presumptive cases or not, uh, that is very much up to you. As I said, the the system is very flexible. It can be configured depending on your local needs. And, um, and in case you are, are reporting your, your suspected cases, you can report as not a case and denotify the patient. Or you can, for example, uh, whether you are doing or not um, suspected cases, or even if you are not doing suspected cases and you're only registering your confirmed cases, once you have a confirmed case, you, not you can notify these patients. And then you go through um, the, the different stages of, of, the, of, the, um, of the treatment course. Therefore, your treatment, your, your laboratory monitoring, laboratory results, and of course your outcome, which can be uh, I mean, uh, different according to, 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 to the patients, be it that is completed, be it that it died, be it that it was lost to follow up. And uh, as Marek also mentioned earlier, we have the new improved tracker coming soon. Um, with uh, with uh, it's not revolutionary, but it has some very important changes that uh, will hopefully facilitate the the data entry even more from the two sides, uh, as I mentioned, from the from the lab side and uh, and the clinical side. So with these, I actually leave it to 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 Yuri to give us a, a quick uh, a quick uh, overview of the of the system and uh, and some and an overview of some patients uh, entered in the system or what you can do with the, with the, this information and of course an overview of the of the dashboards. To you, Yuri. Yes. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Yuri and I'm working in the implementation team and with the metadata packages at the University of Oslo, and I have the. Uh, Fun part, I will show you a quick demo of the data entry forms and the dashboards in DHS2. Uh, what you can see on my screen, and I hope you can see it, uh, is the uh, dashboard of the tracker capture. I'm using the web interface just to point out that uh, DHS2 is available offline as well on Android tablets uh, with uh, uh, extended functionality for uh, data entry and, and uh, reporting. So, <clears throat> but this is the web interface. And what you can see on the left-hand side is the my organization unit tree with all the facilities from our demo database, which is uh, low. So there's no real data uh, here. And I'm showing you a list uh, filtered by the enrollment completion pending, which means, uh, well, these are the cases that I've prepared uh, for, for the presentation. And I will just open one of them to see uh, 
what the data entry looks like. <clears throat> so this case here uh, has no TB registration number because the program um, uh, uh, su supports the the, um, uh, the, the uh, the data entry for presumptive TB cases as well as for the uh, uh, already notified cases. So I just uh, waiting long I'd had to refresh my uh, browser. So I'm back uh, back in here. So uh, as you can see, this is the dashboard uh, of the case of the patient aged 56 years old with the HIV status diagnosis negative. Uh, I see the three events that were registered for this case, and I will start with the uh, registration here. Uh, so the, the case was added to the system as a presumptive TB case. <clears throat> the risk factors were registered, no HIV. There was the status date for, 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 for HIV uh, entered. Uh, and the case is not notified because the diagnostic uh, results, as you can see here from the lab stage, uh, were negative on microscopy and for the expert, which means that I was, uh, uh, at a certain point of, of, the, of data entry, I was prompted to complete the enrollment if the case is not, a diag is not diagnosed with TB. And uh, so in the outcome stage, I've specified this is not a TB case. Uh, and now I can complete my, uh, complete the enrollment. And then the person, as you can see, disappears from my, uh, from my working list. Another example is already a registered case. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there are several more events recorded for that person, starting with the uh, registration. It's a person that is treated after the being lost to follow up. And we can see that the case is notified as bacteriologically confirmed. And those dates that we enter in the system, they help us then uh, analyze the data and produce the indicator values. And I will show you how uh, these uh, uh, data is then later translated to the ones and the zeros on the on our dashboards. <clears throat> so as you can see, that person was registered, started on treatment as a uh, rehabilitation resistant case. <clears throat> uh, and uh, the system is able to calculate all this data. But then, of course, the clinicians uh, have the possibility to overwrite uh, everything manually. And just in general, DHS2 is a flexible system. So uh, a lot of these functionality can be turned off or on. You can add other variables in the system. So it's, uh, it, it's the minimum and this generic requirements that we are adding to our packages, they can always be extended or uh, shortened. As you can see also uh, that <clears throat> after this person is uh, starting the treatment and we see the events in the chronological order, uh, the, we start with the monitoring results to see what is uh, happening. Well, this case, this sample was not recorded as it was uh, rejected for processing. But then we reach uh, after several monitoring events, <clears throat> we reached an unfortunate outcome that this patient has died. And so we can also then uh, complete the enrollment for this case. I will show you one more case here. And because I have a lot of other cases in my list, I will search for this person. So, uh, and I can see I found the enrollment uh, and it's already closed, so I can open it and access it here. Uh, the uh, demographic data and the, the person data that we enter in the system can also be localized. Uh, so we have the information in the system. So now, <clears throat> uh, and I think I will also just echo what uh, Victoria already said, uh, 
I have the tracker data that I can uh, show, uh, summarize in a dashboard. And I will do it here on the example of laboratory testing. And again, this is just the demo, de uh, demo dummy data. So you can see um, that in the laboratory positivity rate uh, data. So all these values come from the cases that were entered into the system. I can see uh, the turnaround time for, for sample processing, the uh, expert data, the culture tests uh, coming up a little bit slow. Yes, further down here. And also for the, uh, I can add to my dashboards lists that will allow me to see, you know, as in this case, the pending uh, events from the lab. So this is an example of how tracker data can be directly shown on the dashboard. But then uh, for, uh, for the scenario where we have both aggregate and uh, tracker implementations, uh, we can uh, also move uh, the tracker data to populate the aggregate dashboards, which you see here on my screen now. So we, we have uh, uh, eight, different dashboards for TB, starting from notifications, moving to outcomes, uh, HIV activities, household contacts, stock. <clears throat> um, and from what you can see here, so the data that you see in these aggregate dashboards on notifications, how many were notified in this period of time, disaggregated by age and sex, then in the percentages, you can see that this data has come from the tracker uh, and it was automatically transferred to uh, fill, to populate these, uh, these visualizations. Uh, and this was done just for one, in, on, on the example of this pivot table, you can see that this has been done just for one region where you can see the numbers here and then those numbers, they then correspond to the uh, national data. Of course, these dashboards can be uh, uh, edited on the fly uh, using uh, filters uh, and allow you uh, various possibilities when, when accessing and analyzing this data. So uh, I think this is uh, it from me on the presentation. Uh, this uh, demo site, I will put the link in the chat uh, and you will be able to play uh, with uh, both aggregate data sets and the tracker uh, system with even with a minimum knowledge of DHS2. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vittoria and Yuri, for this uh, presentation, um, this uh, comprehensive a pragmatic uh, um, uh, and, uh, and very informative uh, presentation. Um, I particularly enjoyed uh, Vittoria, your your comment and your your comments rather about uh, 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 about being careful and uh, when when when. Uh, trying to implement a, a case-based system. I think, uh, uh, as you say, everyone is very excited. Everyone wants to, uh, to get this done, but uh, we need to be absolutely clear of the, of the needs and the commitments that, uh, that need to be in place for, for such an effort to be successful and sustainable. All right, so let's move on to the next uh, session. You, we, we've heard all about guidance and tools and funding opportunities. We've seen a demonstration of the tool. Let's now look at the implementation. Let's look at, uh, so the next presentation is a double act. Um, Marek will be synthesize, will be presenting the results um, from the, um, uh, from a, a synthesis that we've done for uh, five countries uh, that have uh, uh, been implementing the tracker. Um, and then um, Emmanuel Nkiligi from uh, the National TB program Tanzania will be presenting the, the, the specific um, uh, experience from, uh, from, uh, from the country uh, with their efforts to uh, implementing and using the TB tracker. Marek, the floor is yours.
Thank you. Okay, so as Babis mentioned, um, before handing over to our, our colleague in, in Tanzania to talk about their specific experience, I just want to take a couple minutes to present some findings from a multi-country evaluation on the implementation of DHIS2 TB tracker in five countries. So this was an evaluation that was conducted in 2020. We, um, it was conducted by an external team from Logical Outcomes and eShift. Uh, with technical support and coordination by us here at um, at WHO, and the the five countries that participated in this evaluation were Ghana, Laos, Pakistan, Rwanda, and Tanzania. So the the methodological approach to this study was um, was a mixed method, quantitative and qualitative design. Um, the main form of uh, data collection were through semi-structured interviews uh, with um, both international, global, and um, local partners. So that's UIO, Global Fund, um, the NTP at the national and sub-national units, HMIS, and other partners such as um, HISP. They also conducted a survey of frontline workers. So this means those uh, that were um, that are inputting data into DHIS2, so the health facility workers or data entry clerks. And for the analysis, they looked at the seven different dimensions for the evaluation. I'm not going to go through these in, in detail for the sake of time, but I will like to spend um, one slide on the discussion on, on the best practices that they identified um, in um, through this evaluation. So for a very quick summary, they said that the evaluation showed that it's very important to have a robust strategy for planning, uh, design, implementation, and use. Um, so this is, a, this is the development of a clear digital health uh, information um, strategic plan, uh, one that highlights the, the importance and the need for a patient-centric data platform. Um, also one that has both centralized components for um, the coordination, as well as decentralized components for the, the implementation and providing support to its users. There also needs to be a clear implementation plan with an m and &E framework, uh, which um, needs to be used to, to support uh, piloting of the digital system and uh, its eventual staged um, scale up to, to national coverage. And within these um, strategies, we need to take into account staffing, funding, maintenance, and support. So all of these factors need to be considered in, in, in these strategies. There needs to be a strong governance of the process, one that's coordinated by the NTP. A uh, multi-sectoral approach uh, should, be, should be taken um, for, for the implementation of um, digital, digital surveillance systems. Um, we need to have buy-in from all the relevant stakeholders um, at all levels in the country, and especially strong political commitment from the Ministry of Health. Um, we need to make sure that all of the stakeholders that are involved in the implementation process, uh, the planning and implementation process, so that's the NTP, for example, the HMIS, and other relevant department, uh, departments within the Ministry of Health, um, need to have a long-term aligned commitment to, the, the, to a chosen technology and to an approach to collaboration. Just because DHIS2 might be new to the TB program, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's new to the country. Um, so it's, it's a good idea to leverage and build on existing experience and knowledge of DHIS2 and integrate DHIS2 within a coherent health system architecture um, and take this opportunity to access high quality support from experienced um, local teams within the MOH, such as the HMIS team or through international partners, um, such as uh, the HISP net network, which we'll hear more about later. And in terms of strong supportive policies and processes, um, it's important to have a strong middle layer of support with communication across all of these layers to enable district 
level coordinators to provide, uh, well, to monitor and to provide support to the staff in the administrative units within their jurisdiction and to offer an opportunity um, to have a strong community of practice, for example, in the form of forums uh, to support learning and development of the users and to have a virtual working group, for example, to facilitate the discussions and issues and challenges in, in real time. So these are the high level messages in terms of best practices that came out of the evaluation. There's a lot more useful information that, that came out of this, this study, which we um, will eventually like to share, of course. Uh, but with that said, I will now hand over to our colleague in Tanzania to talk about their specific experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. We can see your slides, Emmanuel. You can go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, Tanzania is a country in East Africa with, with a population. A population of nine people, and among the the high the third high TB bad in countries. On the implementation of the, the TB truck, we went some, some steps and there's, we put, put some chemo in Estonia's during the implementation and the, the improvement. The imp improvement of the system with this type still going on as we have some of the component are not included. So initially we said to use the DHS2, the aggregate in 2014. And at that time we conducted the program review and the benchmark assessment, which both recommended for Tanzania to move to a case-based system. Therefore, we approached our in country stakeholders where we put on the load map and the blueprint on what we needed to, to correct. So in 2017, the implementation, the de development of the system started after agreeing on the design and the in initial te testing. So we prepared for the rollout in uh, 2018, where I, before the rollout, we trained the co coordinators at the Sriki and the uh, regional levels, and they also we procured the 200 laptop to be used by the district the, the coordinators, which were our initial data entry. So our initial plan was to do the data entry at the district levels, but, but, but entering the data in a specific health facility. So in 2018, 1st January, we roll out the system and the, the, the data entry was, was initiated, but, but it, just after the rollout, we conducted the on-site on mentorship with the DTLC and the regional staff. And they also we continued providing remote technical assistance. So after the rollout, there was also another standard that 
research mark assessment by the Blue Hedge Field team in uh, July 2018, where uh, there was some recommendation including to adapt the WH dashboard. Therefore, we included the dashboard in 2019, including also to archive the data from the order, from the order database. So we continue with this as some improvement, like including some of the key population. And in 2021, we started to develop a mobile app, which will be integrated in the system to collect the community activities that are at the community level. So to explain more on what we are during the process, we went to some stages, which included the situation and analysis, the stakeholders meeting, and which come up with a lot, a lot of map and a blueprint on what we are planning to collect. So the layout include the initial binary three separate registers, the register for TB, which was a replica of the TB unit register at the facility and the register for the DRTB for the, those in, in the second line TB treatment, and also a tracker to capture the subestimate sub, 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 submitted for capture and the DST. So and the left in 2020, the three registers were merged. Have one register from TB, initial TB diagnosis up to the continue with the second line TB treatment. So the features of the system, the, the, the system where are not, Gold in the box the facilities, the private and the public, and the many resource documents with the TB and the lip plus treatment addies. And we started the data entry at the level by the DTLCs, but also we extended it to some facilities with a big workload and also with the infrastructure like internet and the computers. So also we were, we did improve a little bit the sample tracking system which can track the specimen for catch and DST. Also in the system, we included the quality check report, which is a listing report. Can let's say, for example, the names and the date of state of, of, state of treatment of the patient maybe who are HIV positive that have not, not started the treatment or have not initiated the reality or maybe at the end of the treatment, we can list the patient which do not have treatment with that at the end of the treatment. 
So there's his team who include the 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 pictures which include the dashboard and a scorecard. A scorecard is just for the some selected indicators for the region and the national level to monitor their progress. So what we have learned, learned, learned from the development of the, the system is that the wide stakeholder engagement and planning is essential and the successful monitoring, the continuing monitoring of the process during the development and the rollout. Another thing was the on-site mentorship and the remote technical assistance after the training and the, during the rollout. Customization of the dashboard also helped to, to encourage the data used by the lower level, at least to see the immediate indicator at the dashboard. The challenges mainly were the internet connectivity, uh, the system with the web and they do not have the offline mode. So that data entry and the report begin election are both the there one that is internet connect, connect, connection. Another chat, challenge is the lack of a unique ID, which becomes difficult actually to avoid the duplicate, although we have some set some rules on the, during the entry, the data entry, for example, you think that to be in the registration in number and even the listing of the patient with the names, the resembling names, but, but the issue is still difficult to, to escape the duplicates. So on the way forward, we have started, as I said before, the, the development of the mobile application to capture the community and the levels that that when when she have some offline mode, and they also we are using the data quality checklist. In the DHS2 ETL, the TB track to end now, now for the verification of data at the facility to be done in the system. And the one who is verifying will only need to enter the numbers from the source document. And the other one, another thing we are, uh, have the a good draft is subnational data analysis state, which is a part, 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 part uh, done from the WHO facility data analysis each. And they also we are, with the expansion of the system at the facility level by provision of the infrastructure and the training. So which we are now in the initial stage 
to integrate the system with other healthy systems like the electronic made collect record this which we have started to to build the TB models in the, in the system so that it to enable dialect capture of the patient from the basic system instead of doing the double entry at the head facility. So during our implementation, here are our partners. We were with them from the, the, the planning and the some joining us during the rollout and the improvement of the system. So it is that is what I we are preparing to share with you. Thank you very much for you, Abis. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, an excellent presentation, and uh, I think uh, an important reminder to us all um, of all the work uh, and effort and, and time uh, it really takes to uh, implement, to fully implement at the national level um, case-based surveillance systems uh, for, for any disease program. Um, thank you so much for sharing that information and, and that experience from Tanzania. All right, so let's move on uh, to the last uh, part of the webinar, which uh, uh, is all about what um, each of the three major partners, so WHO, uh, Global Fund, and University of Oslo, uh, how we can support, what, what is our role, and how we can support uh, national TB programs and the partners around the world um, uh, who are interested in, uh, in um, transitioning um, to case-based digital surveillance uh, systems. So this uh, last part of the webinar will be presented uh, by three people. Uh, we are, I believe we're starting with Marek, the Global TV program, to be followed by uh, Michelle Monroe at the Global Fund, and finally, Vittoria Crispino at the University of Oslo. Marek, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, there we go. So as, as um, Babis mentioned, um, three, um, three organizations in this webinar will be, um, will be talking about the ways that uh, they can support countries in, in implementing of the packages for digital surveillance. And this presentation is really to, sh to, to make the point that um, you're not alone uh, in the transition to digital case-based surveillance. There's, there's this international um, network of partners that's available uh, to support you throughout the process. Um, we have a common goal to to support TB programs on uh, digital case-based surveillance that's in line with the overall health information system plans. Um, but with that said, the process to seeking support and the process and the process uh, throughout implementation uh, needs to be led by the country. Um, each of the organizations that's within this uh, network has defined roles and responsibilities, and that's what we're going to be uh, discussing a bit in this presentation, um, which are based on our comparative strengths and, and advantages. Um, but, but still, we take a coordinated and collaborative approach to, to providing support to TB programs. So starting with WHO, we um, play a role in these four dimensions in the process in coordination, development, implementation, and training. And we're going to look at each one in a bit more detail. So our role in, in terms of coordination, um, as we talked a bit about EPI reviews and, and surveillance assessments at, at the beginning of this webinar. Um, so these are able to capture gaps in, in surveillance systems. And um, through these assessments, where we make recommendations uh, to country to countries to address these gaps and move towards um, best practices. 
Beyond EPI reviews and surveillance assessments, we also support on organizing other specialized technical assistance, such as um, assessing the readiness of, of countries uh, in terms of uh, for imp before implementing digital, um, digital case-based surveillance packages. I mentioned this briefly earlier. This is one of the um, products that is, that is coming out towards the, the end of the year. Um, and we can also support on, on carrying out assessments of the system to review the digital system that might be implemented currently in the country to review the indicators um, and data, data elements that are being, um, that are being captured. We're also there to help uh, support in establishing links to the relevant national and international partners, um, depending on the support that's being, that, that's being sought. When it comes to development, we're responsible for, for developing the overall global guidance for surveillance, um, as well as the translation of clinical guidelines into digital solutions by defining the standard indicators and recommended analyses um, and use of, of these data. We contribute as well to the technical development of digital solutions, but we take a more uh, epidemiological focus um, for example, we we work closely with um, University of Oslo, as as we've mentioned, on the development of of DHIS two modules. But our role in this process is more focused on the epidemiological component um, of the development. So we provide um, University of Oslo with the specifications that are needed, so that the standard indicators and dashboard items uh, can be included in the metadata package and. Um, also to make sure that the system is able to capture the relevant uh, data in order to calculate these. We also are responsible for developing associated products, as we mentioned briefly in the first, um, the first session of the webinar. So these products are there to help with um, implementation and the use of the system, um, such as guidance documents uh, on using the system for TB surveillance purposes, um, and, of course, the associated uh, training material. With, uh, for implementation, we don't provide um, the IT technical support for the installation of packages. Um, however, we can guide the configuration of the packages so that they're aligned with um, international WHO standards and support on uh, support the country on defining custom indicators that the program uh, might be interested in, in looking at. We are responsible for the monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of, of the WHO DHIS2 packages. Um, this, is in, this is very important for us uh, so that we can get a, so we can make sure that um, we're providing the adequate support uh, that's within our capacity um, as needed. And we also proactively engage with um, users to collect feedback on the implementation and use of the system. Uh, it's, again, it's important for us to understand what's working well, um, what are the challenges that are being faced by the TB program, and again, this is so that we can uh, provide um, the necessary support. And finally, for training, um, we develop and disseminate these training material um, on the interpretation of indicators, dashboard items, uh, analysis of TB data, and using these data for programmatic action. Um, we're working on an e-course, as I mentioned at, in, at the beginning of this um, webinar, uh, in collaboration with the WHO Academy, which aims to build the foundations on data analysis and use, um, and will disseminate this uh, when it's released to, uh, towards the end of the year. We coordinate and conduct face-to-face -face data analysis and use workshops where DHIS2 is the system that we use um, throughout the workshop um, to guide participants on the analysis of their own TB data. And finally, we also run uh, train the trainer workshops um, so that we can have a set of trainers that, that um, support us in facilitating our data analysis and use workshops that I just mentioned. We also train um, national and subnational staff, and we have and, and we train um, consultants uh, in order to um, have a roster um, that can support our technical assistance activities. 
briefly looking at the scope and process of the of, of our support so you're always welcome to reach out to, to TME um, to have any informal discussions on um, strengthening uh, surveillance systems for TB including transitioning to digital case-based surveillance um, however formal requests for technical assistance need to be made through the um, the, the formal um, pathway through a request of the, at the country office, routed through the regional office, and then um, to HQ. Um, so once we receive um, a, a contact for, for some support, some request for some support, we can have a, an initial discussion that um, where we can assess what kind of needs and type of support are, are being asked for and what skills and strength and what skills are, are going to be required. Um, if needed, we will reroute this request for support towards the um, organization that can, or the relevant uh, partner who can best support that. For example, if it's a request around funding, we might um, put you in touch with the global fund if, if, um, if appropriate or if it's a, a more technical IT support question, then we might uh, route this towards the HISP network. Um, and we, we're there to support you on establishing these, um, these links. So feel free to contact us as a starting point and we can always put you in touch with the relevant partners. We do provide direct support, um, but, but these are more related to support on, on the indicators, data and analyses um, providing training on on data analysis and use. Um, this, um, epidemiological reviews, surveillance assessment, and other related technical assistance. And of course, um, we provide direct support uh, by by sharing um, guidance documents, global products, and and other resources. Um, so if if your request for support is around that type, those types of topics, then of course we will provide direct support that way. Once we, if we do have to reroute re your, your request for support and we make the links to an, another organization, then at that point, um, once the link is, is established, we will be on standby and, and follow up. Um, but we'll, we're there and available um, as, as needed. So we can check in to make sure that the process is, is running smoothly. Um, but do feel free to keep us uh, in copy in, in your communications or do continue to feel free to reach out to us if, um, if uh, some support is needed throughout the process. And we have our names on the bottom of the slide here, so you can reach out to any one of us for this. That's all for the WHO side. So I'm now going to hand over to the Global Fund um, to talk about the ways that um, they can support the process. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Let me put up my screen here, one minute. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, all is good, Michelle, please go ahead. Great, okay. So, um, at the Global Fund, as been mentioned, we are one of the groups that can support with funding on the country implementation, not just of the digital packages as I have here actually, but um, for country implementation and strengthening of um, uh, digital case-based surveillance systems um, for TB or integrated across. And uh, so there's potential for Global Fund uh, support um, for all aspects of that. Um, that includes the initial uh, survey, review, assessment, uh, part of the process, and uh, then using those results to develop roadmaps, plans, and budgets for the digital case-based surveillance system. And then also includes aspects of either implementation of that system, in terms of uh, staffing and um, uh, hardware, software, devices, um, uh, other tools, um, technical assistance, other support. Um, and then also um, 
um, that's not just for deployment, but also really highlighting um, planning for, for maintenance and, and strengthening of these systems. So if you have an existing system or even as part of the deployment of the new system to uh, support uh, making sure that there's uh, sustainable support for that uh, long-term. So those are aspects that potentially can be covered by Global Fund. And um, we can also you know, coordinate the support across um, the different donors um, or other stakeholders in the country and the government who are funding uh, portions of that. Usually um, most of an entire system uh, can't be supported by one, one partner alone and, and needs to be uh, coordinated across multiple partners. And, um, and just to highlight in that initial uh, phase of planning and assessing current situations, um, we do definitely support um, any of the reviews and, and assessments for that as well uh, through the Global Fund as, as possible. Um, we do um, often fund um, TB EPI reviews which include uh, surveillance systems assessments that are, as Merrick mentioned, led by WHO. Uh, and using the results of those to help identify what are the gaps and needs for the digital case-based surveillance system. So and I just have one slide here to describe the process for this. So as with my slide before, uh, earlier in this webinar, the, the main uh, process and place for support is through the Global Fund country grants. Again, that is um, by far where the bulk of Global Fund funding is, is in the Global Fund grants. So there's, uh, you'll, um, if you're a Global Fund country, supported country, you will um, be having current grants right now, the current cycle going through uh, 2023 for most countries. And there may already be existing activities in the current grants for uh, digital case-based surveillance systems, and or there may be possibilities for reprogramming um, or portfolio optimization in the current grants um, that can then um, be used to adjust to support uh, new or um, strengthening activities for uh, digital case-based surveillance. So again, that's where you want to look first is um, into the country grants. Uh, if you um, don't know what's in the grants, you want to contact the relevant Global Fund principal recipient. There's multiple principal recipients in most countries. Um, so usually you want to be looking for the TB uh, national grant, um, which most often is uh, with the TB national program. Um, but there could be also like a Resilient and Sustainable Systems for Health uh, or RSSH grant, which might be run um, through the Ministry of Health overall or through HMIS units, it depends. So again, but um, if you don't know who the PR is, um, then the best place to go is to ask, ask the National TB program. But you can also um, use these steps that I have here to look on the Global Fund website to see what the grants are in a given country and, and see who the principal recipient is for each of those grants. Then next, I really want to highlight um, the, the next cycle coming up. Uh, it's going to be very soon. Um, it's going to come faster than we know that uh, really in very early in 2023. So, you know, less than six months away, countries will start writing and developing their requests to the Global Fund for funding for the next cycle. Um, so this is the main opportunity uh, to, uh, to request funding to the Global Fund um, and um, including for digital case-based surveillance systems. This is something that um, Global Fund is, is supportive of uh, in general and, uh, and we do encourage to be included in the funding requests. Um, it's really key uh, to make sure if um, your TB stakeholders or your HMIS m and &E and digital stakeholders are not already included in the, the country dialogue process for the funding request that they are and, and plan ahead for that now. So con contact what's called your country coordinating mechanism or CCM for your country because um, they're the ones that develop the funding requests. 
and the link there for seeing where they are in the countries um, it is on the, the Global Fund website. And you want to start already discussing how you um, can be involved and in making sure that across the TB, HMIS, m &E, and digital stakeholders, um, the right folks are involved and consulted and, and bringing in their roadmaps and budgets and planning into this funding request process. Um, so again, just to really highlight um, global fund grants and looking at existing ones and then really uh, planning for the next cycle. Um, what are your needs for strengthening your uh, surveillance systems overall for TB, HIV and, and malaria and uh, pandemic preparedness? Then the other uh, process or possibility for support for um, implementing strengthening uh, case-based surveillance systems and including um, use of these packages and tools that were discussed today. Um, again, it's much smaller, um, but we do have some centrally funded technical assistance through the Data Strategic Initiative. And um, in particular, if there's particular bottlenecks where this can't be funded through the grant um, for some reason, then um, this exists to be able to do some short-term TA to, um, to um, get through those bottlenecks and address global fund strategic priorities. So for that, again, um, you need to um, contact your global fund uh, pr principal recipient and the principal recipient can then request it through the global fund country team um, here in Geneva if um, this TA is a, a possible support mechanism. So with that, I will then um, hand over, I think next is um, University of Oslo. That's correct. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Victoria, over to you. Yes, yes thank you very much. Um, okay, just a second, because I'm not sure quite yet. Voila. I hope you see it. Um, okay, so, from our our side of things, which is more like a, the IT part of the implementation, um, on different like we can we can uh, we can support at different levels. Of course, in the global goods side of things, as as Marek mentioned, um, while the WHO, for example, uh, gives us the the core information, the content information for the packages. We, um, we work uh, as, a, as a global team uh, that is, uh, is mostly based in, uh, in Oslo. Um, we provide the installable metadata templates, the implementation guides, training material, and we have the global support network uh, that, uh, that kind of like, I don't want to say supervise, but uh, that centralize the, the information, let's say. And then we have like uh, the support that is actually scattered throughout, throughout the, the world uh, through some uh, regional hubs of, uh, of uh, his groups um, who can provide technical assistance directly to the Ministry of Health, um, either to integrate new, 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 new functionalities or to, to adapt um, some of the packages um, into either existing uh, uh, systems or um, new, completely new. So starting from scratch, of course, it can happen either or. Um, they can host regional uh, trainings, they can conduct a training uh, of trainers, um, both for national, but also like down to the uh, lower administrative level if necessary. Um, and then of course, they can also support national implementation um, for the implementation of the national uh, to the and the, the adaptation to the of the of the packages to the national uh, toolkit and uh, and guidelines and and again conduct uh, design workshops uh, deploy local innovation um, and of course this is dependent and the um, the planning and the, and the needs of of, of of funding for this specific kind of, of of work it's of course very much dependent on the national plans for for the long term. The his network here, as you can see, is quite scattered all over the places. In in Oslo, there is the core team, but here we have, um, I think nowadays it's more or less uh, seventeen groups that uh, are are a little bit all over the places, and uh, these are super trusted. They are actually our eyes and ears um, to provide implementation support, local customization, configuration. And, uh, and most importantly, I think it's like a, it's important to highlight uh, in order 
um, to strengthen the surveillance, what is, is very much all about is long-term sustainability, which means um, um, regional and in-country capacity building. So they try also to train locally, either people that are sitting in the MOH or in general, any kind of like IT group that deals with the, with the, with the health information system to actually uh, in the long term, in the long term, to be able to to self sustain and work alone, so there is not this kind of like long term dependency on the his groups. But uh, to get them started, they can they can provide training, they can provide uh, information, they can provide customization, and um, but and also of course um, the his groups also provide uh, a very innovative local developments through apps. Uh, through apps uh, uh, that can be customized locally and can be very useful also to, to improve your, your, your surveillance and the strengthening of these activities. Um, finally, I just wanted to give like some important and useful resources that you can, uh, you can use uh, to have an overview of the packages, um, either from the website where we can have the, the, the resources that I was mentioning earlier, so be it the implementation guide or the design guide of the packages. Um, but we also have the demo that Yuri also posted the, the link earlier in the chat, but here you have it as well. Um, the, the download of the metadata packages and very important, the community of practice. This, this is very useful because there we share uh, all kind of information, be it from success stories to use cases that are particularly important that can help other countries or users to move forward, but also uh, to hiccups or solutions that have uh, helped other countries and we just want to share like uh, DHS2 is open source we just like keep everything open and very shareable among all the DHS users therefore we share as much as we can through the community of practice if you would like to 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 get started on any kind of implementation we strongly suggest to get in touch directly with our his network um, but if you do not know because you have never had any kind of contact and you do not know uh, who exactly you should get in contact with, please, uh, or you have also like some general questions that you would like to, to clarify, please get in touch with us at the, at the email that is here at the bottom of the, of the slide and we'll be more than happy to put you in touch with the relevant people or clarify any kind of information there that you would like to, to have. So back to you, I guess, Pappas. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Vittoria. Um, all right, so this, uh, this concludes the um, uh, presentations we had uh, planned uh, for, for this webinar. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a long journey. Um, I thank you for uh, staying with us. Um, I think, um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, um, you got the message that there is uh, uh, quite a lot of work that um, has been done uh, in terms of uh, development, um, uh, in terms of guidance and tools, in terms of uh, uh, collaboration and coordination across a number of global partners, and there's, in fact, there's many more. Uh, we've just, um, uh, there were three of us uh, talking today, but we are aware that there is a, a similar, uh, there are similar efforts done by a number of other uh, partners in global health. Um, the message we would like to send to you is that um, uh, if you are interested in strengthening your surveillance system, if you are in the process of transitioning from a paper system to a fully digital case-based surveillance system, and I hope the message that you got today was that this is a gradient and it's not a binary, you cannot go from one to the other um, like that. Uh, it, it takes time and effort to do that. Um, well, uh, we at WHO, and uh, you've heard uh, uh, also people at the Global Fund and, and also uh, Oslo, the University of Oslo and, and the regional HISPs are, are there to, uh, to help you. Um, perhaps uh, before, before I, um, I close the webinar, so we have been uh, um, monitoring the chat, uh, I think, uh, um, most, if not all, of the uh, relevant questions have been uh, have been answered. Let me say once again, we will be sharing as a, a news flash recordings from this um, uh, webinar in all available uh, languages. So that will be coming over the next few days, um, and and perhaps just to um, um, 
mention once again uh, a couple of, uh, of of key messages. So um, you heard today the TV surveillance uh, work, um, uh, and I, I just would like to um, uh, mention once again that this is all done within the overall context of the of the health management information system. So this is work that uh, we um, recommend uh, TB programs and their partners do in collaboration with uh, the overall uh, digital uh, plans that um, ministries of health and, and countries uh, have. So this is not a standalone exercise. It should really be um, uh, interlinked with the overall uh, HMIS plans and digital plans the country has. Um, the TB is one example. Uh, we, uh, in fact, um, I have been collaborating with all other major disease programs that exist. And really the idea is that uh, we build uh, a surveillance system for uh, for all disease programs. Uh, we've had the opportunity to present you the work that we've been doing in the TV world, but similarly, this uh, work uh, is happening in other disease programs. So I would definitely encourage all of you to um, familiarize yourselves with that work and really promote this concept of uh, integration and collaboration and interoperability um, um, uh, across, across disease programs and throughout the uh, the health system. Um, so, and let me then uh, close the webinar by uh, really thanking uh, the presenters uh, for uh, all their uh, excellent work, the interpretation, admin and IT support, uh, my colleagues, um, Marek, uh, Lali and Peter Nguhiu, and uh, all of you, the participants. Um, I hope you have found this uh, useful. And um, please feel free to contact us with any follow-up questions or comments that you might have. Thank you very much for being with us. Bye-bye.